My name is Peter Lavinia. I'm running for state senate here in Albany and in uh, Troy, District 44, uh, obviously with the Green Party. Some of you know me, some of you don't. I uh, just want to talk a little bit about my campaign and then we can um, get to the, uh, the, the rest of the evening. Um, like Jill, I'm running to make a difference. Um, I'm running against uh, an 18 year incumbent, Neil Breslin. I'm running against the Democratic machine here in Albany and Troy. And I'm running against somebody who won't debate me. Um, even though I was only opponent in the race. And I'm running because we have a series of crises going on both in New York State and I think at the national and international level that uh, we need to address that the Democrats and Republicans aren't addressing. And I think that my platform and that Jill's platform, as you see, are the only ones that are able to address this. Uh, first... Okay, like Peter said, good evening everybody. I'm Ali Kratzit, one of his campaign workers. Uh, thanks for joining the Green Party of New York State tonight as we welcome our presidential candidate, Dr. Jill Stein. Uh, Dr. Stein is a Harvard-educated physician, mother, teacher of internal medicine, and environmental health advocate. She has run in the 2002 and 2010 Massachusetts gubernatorial elections with the Boston Phoenix, citing her as the winner in a 2002 debate against Republican presidential nominee Mitt Romney. She has stood on the front lines with the Occupy movement and the phenomenally successful Chicago Teachers Union strike. Along with her running mate, Sherry Honkala, she is a member of the only two women ticket in a year when women's rights are being threatened by one party and ignored by another. Dr. Stein stands for Workers in Union Rights, Reforming Wall Street, Tuition-Free Higher Education and Student Debt Forgiveness, Banning Hydrofracking, and many other exciting ideas that will help our own state as well as our nation. Please join me in welcoming Green Party presidential nominee, Dr. Jill Stein. So, um, yeah, thank you all so much for coming out tonight. Thank you, Ellie, for that very nice introduction. And Peter, really great to hear what you're up to. Um, really exciting to be going around the country and especially hearing from our local green candidates who are really rising up strong all over the place have just come from uh, a rally with Ursula Rosen and her congressional campaign, which is doing great because the Democrat is actually melting down and it's turning out to be her and her, basically her. She's the only one who's sort of standing up and challenging the incumbent Republican. And uh, it's just really, really exciting to see all kinds of people coming out to say that, yeah, it's really time for us to be standing up for the peaceful, just, secure, green future that we need and that is long overdue. And it seems like there is this, um, this outgroup right now of a powerful social movement for democracy and justice. And there couldn't be a better time for us to be rising up as a political party, because that movement needs a voice. And it needs a choice that's not bought and paid for by Wall Street. And in fact, we say that to go into the voting booth and vote and pull the lever for either Wall Street-sponsored candidate basically gives them a mandate for four more years of the same. And that is the very definition of throwing away your vote. So it's like all around us now, there is this movement for democracy and justice from the democracy revolutions in the Middle East to the Occupy movement all over the country, which is not going away. It may have been evicted, but it is still alive and well. The blockades of the Keystone Pipeline, of the fracking sites, of the evictions of homeowners from their homes the student strikes to stop tuition hikes, and we've seen the incredible success in Quebec where the students actually rolled back mm -hmm. the tuition hikes. Um, uh, really across the board, there's this very, and the, and the Chicago Teachers Union that I should mention as well, really standing up in spite of having a Democratic mayor that was Barack Obama's right-hand man and having originated you know, Arne Duncan and the whole policy, the education policies adopted by Democrats, originated by Democrats. Sort of an extension of what was going on under Republicans, you know, the, the shades of gray between no child left behind and race to the top, you know, it's really hard to find the differences. And according to the Chicago Teachers Union, 
The difference is, is that it just got much more aggressive at teacher bashing and privatizing our schools and downgrading education to just high stakes testing, which is the worst way possible to educate kids, especially challenged learners who are the ones that all this education reform was supposed to be for anyhow. So, you know, to see the teachers actually standing up in an election, you know, against a Democratic mayor so closely associated with Obama, and they rolled out the red carpet for us, and we're not used to that, you know? <laughs> we're not used to the red carpet being rolled out from labor, and actually given uh, an opportunity to speak and thanked and to have the teachers actually exclaiming that in their view there was absolutely nothing to lose here by standing up and voting uh, for what we need and you know to fix this crisis educationally, economically, environmentally. It was just really exciting to see usually Democrat subservient um, organized labor breaking away and actually standing up not only for their rank and file but standing up for their schools standing up for their communities uh, it was just incredibly exciting so we're in this very historic moment right now where all this stuff is breaking out all around us and as democracy is breaking out we also see people breaking away from the establishment politics that got us here which you put it all together and it kind of says that we can make this election a really powerful tipping point to take back our democracy. Because an election is a time when people get kind of focused and you talk to people you don't normally talk to and it's a, it's a national conversation. If it's not that, when else are you gonna have this national conversation? So it's a really, it's an exciting time to make it a tipping point. And we badly need that tipping point, as you know, because people have really hit the breaking point on the economy, on jobs, on our democracy, on the climate, on human rights, uh, on the environment, our civil liberties, you name it, we're really at the breaking point now. And what is so exciting is that people have really realized that we're not here just because of one party, but we're really here because both parties in this political establishment have delivered crisis after crisis. And then in fact, we're accelerating in the wrong direction. It's not just that we're not moving forward, we're actually moving backwards, faster and faster, both under Democrats and Republicans. And I like to just run through the track record because now that it's election time, we hear all kinds of warm and fuzzy talk. You know, and it's easy to be shaken up like the Etch-a-Sketch you know, and just forget about what the track record is because we're told to just listen to the talk and forget about the walk. But there's actually quite a walk that we've been through over these past four years, as well as the eight years before that, and the eight years before that. You know, we've been sort of on this downward trajectory right now, and it's just important to remember how much this has been a bipartisan collaboration. So I'm just going to run through some of the highlights of the last four years to point out that in so many ways, the Obama White House actually embraced the policies of George Bush and went far beyond in many ways, in many dangerous and uh, destructive ways. So just to run through the list, because if you haven't made up your mind yet, you know, it's, it's nice to reality check before you make up your mind, and you may find yourself if you have made up your mind, talking to a lot of people who are saying, you're going to vote for who? And how dare you do that? And it's really important to be able to walk them through, you know, what, what the reality is on the ground here. So on the Wall Street bailouts, you know, we were all told you got to toe the line and vote for the lesser evil because you don't want a president who's going to expand these Wall Street bailouts. But what did we get? $700 billion under George Bush, but four and a half trillion in dollars dispersed under Barack Obama, plus another 16 trillion in these uh, free loans, basically, and zero interest loans. They just started another uh, Wall Street bailout that you may or may not have heard about a week and a half ago, with the Fed now doing QE3, third quantitative easing. This is the fourth bailout for Wall Street. 
What exactly has gotten better as we've been bailing them out and bailing them out? They're not making the loans. They have more cash on hand. They are in charge as ever. The Dodd-Frank bill, basically toothless, gutless, useless. Banks are bigger than ever and more, you know, more impervious to uh, regulation than ever. They're still writing their own rules in Congress and they're still running the White House. They're still very much in charge in the White House. So, you know, on the Wall Street bailouts, went ballistic under Obama. How about the free trade agreements that offshore our jobs and undermine wages at home? It was a Democrat who gave us the first free trade agreement. It was Bill Clinton who signed it. It was George Bush who enacted it. And then it took Barack Obama to then expand free trade agreements, again, with the Colombia, Panama, Korea agreements, as well as now this Trans-Pacific Partnership. Does that ring a bell for people? It's, it's another one of these free trade agreements. And if you're not familiar with the term, a free trade agreement is free if you're a corporation. But if you're a human being, it's extremely costly because it undermines wages here and also in the countries uh, that we're in agreement here with. It allows a lot of dumping of cheap US goods. That's what generated the whole wave of undocumented immigrants into this country. It was the dumping of illegal goods. I'm sorry, legal but very expensive goods into the Latin American cultures that uh, basically displaced millions of farmers and small families who could not feed their, could no longer feed their families and had to come here in the hope of avoiding starvation. And this Trans-Pacific Partnership does more of the same, also undermines American sovereignty by creating these international corporate boards which pass judgment on our laws and our regulations if we're trying to protect labor standards protect our water supply or our food. You know, it's the corporate board that gets to rule on whether this is uh, legitimate in their eyes or not. So this is a terrible thing. Again, another case in which Obama has gone far beyond what George Bush was able to get away with. Student debt, absolutely skyrocketing. Began to go up under Bush, but got much, much worse under Obama. And the difference between Romney and Obama on student debt is not up. They both promised to stay the course on student debt, that they would keep interest rates from getting more out of hand, but where they are right now and the horrible terms of these loans, customized specially for students, lacking any semblance of consumer protection. You'd think students must be public enemy number one for, you know, for the way that students are being treated and put at the bottom of the list of priorities in this election. So student loans are, again, another indicator of that. And debt has skyrocketed. And Obama and Romney have basically promised to do absolutely nothing about that. While we have a generation of students that have been turned into indentured servants with high rates of debt, owing a trillion dollars, and having 50% rates of unemployment and underemployment, which means people are really, really stuck. Or look at the war, for example, the expanding war, where on day three in office, the president intensified the bombing in Pakistan. Where were the Republicans in the room exactly to blame that one on? It was still the honeymoon period after his, you know, his mandate to do what he wanted. Well, it turned out what he wanted was to intensify the bombing in Pakistan and then spread the drone wars to Yemen and Somalia surged the troops into Afghanistan and actually pulled out from Iraq. Do people know why Obama actually had to pull out when he did? It was George Bush we have to thank, yes. Um, for those who aren't aware, Bush had negotiated with the government of Iraq a date on which U.S. soldiers no longer had immunity. They could no longer be there. Obama worked very, very hard to extend that date of immunity so that he could indefinitely keep our army there. And it was thanks to George Bush, ironically, under the Obama administration, it was George Bush who actually got us out of Iraq. He got us in, and he got us out. Um, so, you know, and we're seeing the blowback all over the Middle East now with the, 
with the demonstrations at the U.S. Embassy, the killing of the Libyan ambassador, that tragedy, uh, as well as the fact in Pakistan, 75% of Pakistanis now identify the U.S. as their chief enemy, not the Taliban, not Al-Qaeda, but the United States. And this is not so different from what you'd expect when you have a bombing campaign that's doing what the drones are doing, dropping bombs on weddings and funerals, high civilian casualty rate, very low rate of actually um, targeting true high-ranking members of, of Al-Qaeda and other terrorist organizations. So this is a dreadfully wrong-headed policy if you were trying to define a foreign policy to actually uh, help your enemy and recruit more people to their cause. This is pretty much what's being accomplished under this brute, this policy of brute military force. And it seems to be a competition between Romney and Obama about who's going to be the more effective tough guy here. And it's clear that a tough guy policy, you know, is not what we need. We need an international policy based on human rights uh, and international law and diplomacy. Uh, just a couple other things to uh, name. The attack on our civil liberties, bad under George Bush, but then all those violations got codified under Barack Obama. And that includes criminalizing the right to protest, uh, the president establishing for himself and for all future presidents the dictatorial right to throw you into prison without charge or trial, at the president's pleasure, basically. Does not need to justify it uh, to anyone. And also the right of assassination, including US citizens. So this has not been, um, you know, this is not what people were told they were going to get by voting for the lesser evil. You know, this in fact is worse than what we had under George Bush. And this is not to exonerate George Bush, and it's not to exonerate Mitt Romney either. But just to point out that this strategy of telling you to be quiet, be good little boys and girls, and don't make waves, don't make trouble, go along to get along, do the lesser evil thing. It's just really important to clarify where this policy has taken us. That, in fact, the politics of fear has actually brought us everything we were afraid of. Because what is it that stops those bad things? It's basically the politics of courage in standing up for the things that we actually need. If we absent our voices, what we have left is just corporate spin campaigns that are all competing for more corporate cash to fund their campaigns. So it's a very convenient public relations campaign, you know, to tell us uh, to be quiet and that we need to, thank you, that we need to um, go along to get along. In fact, it's the politics of courage. And I have to mention also that on climate, we've gotten pretty much the same thing with, um, you know, in, with Obama embracing this, uh, you know, the drill baby drill policies of, of George Bush, giving the thumbs up to fracking, to more offshore oil drilling, to exploration in our national parks, in the very fragile, uh, at-risk environment in the Arctic, where we've just seen the lowest ebb of ice ever, decades ahead of schedule, you know, which really should be a real heads up about needing to take the kinds of action that Peter was talking about, that we need to do that now. The president undermined, if you may remember, the International Climate Accords in South Africa, saying we can wait until 2020. We can't wait till 2020. We can't wait until uh, 2016. We need to stand up now, because what drives us forward is that politics of courage. Whether we win the office, if we win the office, we can turn the White House into a greenhouse, and it would be a better world for everybody. But even short of winning the office, we can win the day by driving these solutions forward. So, you know, that's what we're calling for. A vote for business as usual is that, even if it's a reluctant vote, even if it's a lesser evil vote, it comes out as a statistic, which is a mandate for more of the same. So, you know, in, in my view, that is the essence of wasting your vote. In fact, it's worse than wasting your vote. It's actually using your vote as a weapon against yourself. 
on behalf of Wall Street and its, its sponsored political parties and their candidates. It's very clear where they're going. They do not have a single exit strategy that they're even talking about, let alone that you could trust them to actually enact. They're not even pretending. You know, they're not talking about poverty, they're not talking about climate change, and they're certainly not talking about, you know, how to solve these problems. Barack Obama went to Wall Street, actually it was his campaign manager, went to Wall Street at the turn of the year, like last January or February, and promised Wall Street he wasn't going to talk about them, wasn't going to badmouth them, he was soliciting money for the super PACs, so he said, don't worry, we're not going to bring Wall Street into this. You know, this campaign will have nothing to do with you. Uh, he's going to talk about Romney, but he's not going to criticize Wall Street. So, you know, how exactly are we going to move forward if we can't talk about this behemoth that has our economy by the neck? So, you know, it's very clear that, that we've got the solutions in hand. And, and this is the flip side of all those bad policies which are helping to generate this incredible uprising. Uh, there is a rebellion going on, because I've been touring that rebellion, you know, in, in the course of this campaign. We get to go to hot spots all over the country, and it's just so exciting to see this rebellion that is in full swing. And our job is to give that rebellion a voice in this election and a choice at the polls. And we're seeing people really excited and rising up about that. The statistics right now say 90 million voters are not going to vote. That's one out of every two. It's almost twice as many as the number that are thought to come out for Obama, and almost twice as many as the number that are thought to come out for Romney. So most people are not happy campers. Mm -hmm. Polls show that people are calling for a third party and saying that they would seriously consider voting for one. They keep us tied up, you know, getting on the ballot for 90% of the election, and then we have four weeks to actually run. Mm -hmm. So now that we are on the ballot, and thanks to many people here that helped us get on the ballot, we're on the ballot for 85% of voters across the country. Thank you all for that. And we also achieved matching funds, which was another kind of history making in this campaign, and another sign of how People are really coming out of this woodwork now to create a real alternative political party. Even the Occupy movement, which was, you know, sort of uh, arm's length early on, is now just rolling out the red carpet and inviting us to come and speak, not endorsing as Occupy, because Occupy is a social movement. It's not a political campaign. <laughs> And the wolves are at their door, so they're absolutely right, you know, not to be endorsing political parties. But we find occupiers are really excited and are, are realizing that while elections are rigged, everything out there is rigged. When you go to Occupy or to demonstrate and you're surrounded by, by police in, you know, in full military riot gear and there are helicopters overhead and the press isn't reporting it, that's a pretty rigged scenario as well. So, you know, Occupy is realizing that we need to occupy the voting booth too. And the other thing that is so exciting in this election is that the public actually is on board on every one of these issues that we're advancing in this election. So we have on our side not just the power of truth, the facts, justice, democracy, but we also have public opinion on our side here on issue after issue. So if we can get the word out that we're here, we could really see the polls rise in a big way that would be really exciting. Let me just quickly run through that agenda. Um, you heard Peter pretty much talk about it, so I'll just say briefly, the Green New Deal is, uh, is the centerpiece of our campaign. It's like the New Deal that got us out of the Great Depression. Uh, it basically says that we have an emergency. We have an economic emergency as well as a climate emergency, and we can solve them both at once, and we can do it by directly creating jobs for about the same amount of money that we spent uh, in the first stimulus package in 2009. But that had as its largest component tax breaks. Tax breaks don't create jobs. What the Green New Deal will do is make funding available at the community level for communities to directly create those jobs. And that means public works and public services, as well as providing 
the incentives and the startup and free loans for small businesses and worker cooperatives. So it's a broad spectrum of the economy across clean energy, clean renewable energy, as well as local organic agriculture, public transportation, including active transit, so you can get your exercise on the way to work, or kids can walk to school safely, as well as hiring back our teachers, how about? And creating affordable housing and after school violence and drug abuse prevention and rehabilitation. So that's the Green New Deal in a nutshell. It pays for itself by jump-starting the economy and recreating those revenues which fell out of the economy during the Wall Street crash. We really need a true jump start, not just two or three million jobs, which is what that former stimulus package did. Mm -hmm. Didn't create enough jobs to really get the economy going, and it was mostly tax breaks. So this Green New Deal is actually about putting those dollars to work, creating jobs, and getting a new economy going, which also puts a halt to climate change, and importantly, makes wars for oil obsolete, because we no longer need them. We've got green energy here at home. We're calling for health care as a human right under Medicare for All. And are people familiar with that here? Pretty much. OK, so I won't go into that now. Uh, we'll talk about it more later if, if you have questions. But basically, covers everybody comprehensively. You've heard, you know, you, you, you heard Obama, if you watched the last debate, pseudo debate, false debate. Uh, you heard Obama and tell Romney that he agreed with him on Social Security? Yes. Heads up, you know, the cuts are coming yes. from both Democrats and Republicans. Same is true on Medicare. Um, there is that $700 billion cut that the Republicans are accusing the Democrats of. Uh, and it's true, it is, work, work, it is built into the Affordable Care Act, and it is a real problem. Uh, likewise, the Republicans are also planning to cut Medicare. Uh, by about the same amount and privatize it as well. So there's stuff coming on both ends. The real solution to the problem of Medicare is that we need to enlarge Medicare and create Medicare for everyone and fix that boondoggle for pharmaceutical companies, the um, Medicare Part D, uh, which we can do. And in making uh, all health care part of Medicare, we can actually save trillions of dollars over the coming decade. So both Democrats and Republicans are saying we need austerity. We know from looking at Europe, we also know from the experience before the New Deal back in the 1930s, austerity does not work. It just makes things worse and creates a lot of chaos and violence out in the street while you're at it. So austerity is absolutely the wrong way to go. Well, there's a choice. There are many choices, in fact, to avoid austerity, and one of them is health care for everyone as a human right. So how about it? Which would you prefer, Medicare for all or austerity to solve the problem of the budget deficit? It's like, it's like an absolute no-brainer. We need to bail out the students, as I mentioned before, instead of bailing out the banks. Right now, this QE3, quantitative easing 3, is giving $40 billion a month to the banks, again. How about instead we just apply that to student loan debt and we can wipe out student loan debt in the next two years? That would be a good move forward. Likewise, on, on uh, the cost of public higher education, we've got a great solution. Make it free. It costs between 15 and 30 billion a year to provide free public higher education. That comes out of Jeffrey Sachs at, at Columbia. And thank you. Um, and what happened in after the Second World War, you may recall, with um, the GI Bill, paid for free college education. For every dollar we invested, we got back seven dollars into the economy. It more than pays for itself. The startup money can readily come from the Wall Street bailouts or a tax on Wall Street. In fact, a 5%, I'm sorry, a 0.5%. So you go to the store, you pay 4% sales tax for the state. 7, 8. 7, 8, okay. 7, 8 as your total? Either 7 or 8, state 4%. State and county, okay. Yeah, so you're paying a good chunk. 
Wall Street is like the only sector of the economy that's not paying a sales tax. You know, why should they not pay a sales tax, the richest sector of the economy? If they paid half a percent, it would generate $350 billion to put into the economy, which is, you know, covers a whole lot for creating jobs, for, uh, you know, for making public higher education free, et cetera, for the things that we need. And finally, I'll just mention immigrant rights. We need to respect as human rights and create a welcoming and legal path to citizenship. We can do it now. Obama's little step forward was a little tiny step forward while he was taking a giant leap backwards with his so-called Secure Communities Program, which has deported and targeted and split more families in this country in his first three years of office than George Bush did in all eight years. So immigrants are the strength of our country. We are all immigrants on this bus. It's time to celebrate and appreciate the latest wave of immigrants. And to the extent that there are real issues with large migrations, large forced migrations of people who came here as economic refugees, we need to go back and fix NAFTA so that we're not forcing people to leave their communities and their families to start with, because people don't want to uproot. They uproot when they're forced to by economic crisis. So fixing those free trade agreements and turning them into fair trade agreements is actually the solution to the so-called immigration crisis. And then finally, I'll just say downsizing the military is a key part of this as well. And we're calling for cutting back the military, right-sizing it to year 2000 levels. Since then, it has doubled. We are certainly not twice as secure for having a more tough guy uh, presence all around the world. We need to bring the troops home from Afghanistan, home from Iraq, where they still are, more as private security contractors, but no less uh, dangerous for being a, a, a private force rather than part of our national armed forces. We need to bring our troops home also from the bases, over a thousand bases in over 140 countries around the world. So these are sort of the basic dimensions. Also, let's end the war on drugs. Let's legalize marijuana. It's a substance that's dangerous because it's illegal. It's not illegal on account of being dangerous. So a whole variety of solutions. The American people supports them. It's time for us to stand up. The Democratic and Republican parties are not going to lead the way forward. In the words of Frederick Douglass, Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never has and it never will. Just to look back at the labor movement, for example. What, what moved us forward for the rights to unionize, for safe workplaces, for the 40-hour work week? All these things that benefit not just unions, but benefited everyone in this country, all of us. It took a social movement out on the streets. People had to fight for all of those things and more. And it took independent political parties in the form of the labor, the socialists, the progressive parties. It was those parties that drove that agenda into the political dialogue and actually forced the hand of FDR, for example, and others because there was a real political threat out there. No threat, no forward movement. And it's been true really with just about every major social and economic transition in this country, including the abolition of slavery, women's right to vote. It always took a social movement on the ground, plus an independent political party. We are that independent political party in this race, and we owe, I think, you know, a real uh, thanks to the Green Party and those who were able to stick it out in that decade of fear campaigns and smear campaigns against not only the Green Party, but the Labor Party, the Progressive Party, the New Party, they were all wiped out by that fear campaign. The Peace and Freedom Party, they used to be a national voice. Now they have ballot status maybe in one state or two states, if at all. The Socialist parties, likewise, they've been pretty much wiped out by the fear mongering uh, against independent politics of the last decade. It's only the Greens that actually live to fight another day. Because I think, yes. Because once you see how things are connected, which is really what the Green Party is about, 
It's not just about the planet, it's also about the people and peace and democracy. Once you see how it's all connected, it's not like you can find some safe place where this stuff is not you know, very much at risk, and it's not like you can forget about it. So um, you know, as Greens, we're here for the long haul, and if we win this race, if we win the office, that's great, but we can also win the day by standing up and reclaiming our political voice and our political courage. Because as Alice Walker again says, two things, uh, that, that the biggest way people give up power is by not knowing we have it to start with. Well, people are realizing that we have it, and it's time for us to use it. And her other quote that I love to say every day is that basically we are the ones we've been waiting for. They're not going to do it for us. They are only accelerating us in the other direction. So it's not just okay to vote for a Green Party. It's life-saving, it's job-saving, it's planet-saving. So we have the power. It's up to us to push ahead. Just think, there are 36 million students and recent graduates who are indentured servants. They're really good at Facebook. If this goes viral, <laughs> if this goes viral, we could see our own Tahrir Square. 36 million votes is actually enough to totally turn the tide. But remember, it's a, it's a game of psychological warfare. They're really working overtime to convince us that we're powerless, when in fact we are powerful. Mm -hmm. Remember that we are winning just about every poll out there when it comes to the issues. The public is with us. So there is no end to what we can accomplish. We'll go as far as we can in this election, and that's the jumping off point for where we go in, in the next one. Uh, and for all of our local candidates as well, who are really pushing forward all across the country now. It's just so exciting to see how many of them are breaking in to city councils, to school committees, uh, to mayors as well, and some legislatures this year. We've got candidates who are really well positioned to break into state legislatures too. So it's a really exciting time. We can actually use this election to turn that breaking point we face into the tipping point we need to take back our democracy and the peaceful, just, green future we deserve. Thank you all so very much for being here and making it so. bitter, vicious, contested election I've ever been a part of. It's been exactly the opposite. It's been like giving out candy. I don't hear, you know, that kind of naysaying against third parties. I like almost, it's like a deafening silence. People are, are sort of afraid to stand up and make such claims because if they're informed, they know it's preposterous. Um, so. It's really a great time to be getting the word out, and you'll find um, a lot of people are just waiting to discuss this. I find when people bring up the spoiler issue, it's usually because they're wrestling with it themselves. And um, you know, in a, in a way, it's almost like we're being political therapists to talk to our friends <laughs> who are stuck in abusive political relationships. <laughs> And, you know, when you're talking to people stuck in abusive relationships, there are a variety of strategies. So sometimes it's the reality check and that little litany of the facts on the ground. The reality check sometimes helps some people, but as you know, a lot of people in abusive relationships are very defended against hearing anything about it. They're busy apologizing for their abuser. He really loves you in his heart, you know. He didn't mean to take away your jobs and, you know, the Republicans made him do it. Or it was that addiction, not to alcohol in this case, it was that addiction to the money that he has to have for his campaign. So all of that. So, so it's a great time to be talking with people about this. If you're in a position to contribute, um, it's a really great time to do that. And I'll tell you why. In some ways, it's like there is a 40 to 1 match. In the first part of the election, in the primary, we were going for a 1 to 1 match, and we made it and we brought in hundreds of thousands of dollars actually from the federal government 
through federal matching funds, which was a wonderful achievement, and big thank you to everyone here who helped make that possible. Now, in this part of the election, here's what we're going for. There is a $20 million federal grant which becomes available to us if we can boost our numbers. We've been coming up, even before we started running a real race, while we were just busy getting on the ballot, too busy to do outreach, we've been just coming up spontaneously in the polls from undetectable to 1% and doubling that to 2%, which is millions of votes, and it's really a huge achievement that that happened. If we simply lock in on that, that's a huge step forward. It's actually 20 times better than what we've been able to achieve over the past 10 years. So that would be huge. But we have the potential, now that we're running a real campaign, to double those numbers again and maybe a little bit more. And we can do that now because we're not totally tied up getting on the ballot. We can actually get the word out. So our, our, our estimate is that it will take us about the same amount of money that it took us in the primary, which was a half a million dollars. If we can raise a half million dollars now, we have this option, if we get to 5%, we get $20 million from the feds so that we can hit the ground running with our next presidential race. So it's effectively raise half a million, get 20 million. That is a match like none you will ever get anywhere. I mean, it's like the best investment you could possibly make with your dollars. It means a 40 to one match and it means that if we're at 5%, it's going to be really hard for them to deny the issues that we're talking about. Making public higher education free, bailing out the students, health care as a human right, a Green New Deal, downsizing the military. If we start coming up in the polls, you know, it's really game over for politics as usual. It's a real heads up that there is something building that the uh, public interest that we the people have a voice again on the political stage in the United States of America. So, and with all the achievements in the primary, we're hoping that we can deliver on the promise of where we've come so far and blow the lid off of politics as usual in the next four weeks. So thank you all so very much. Party on the local level. Um, in Kentucky, for example, we had to gather 4, 000, between 4 and 5,000 votes to get Jill on the ballot. Signatures. So just, yeah. yeah, signatures. What did I say? Votes. 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 Signatures, sorry. <laughs> well, it's a bit of a long day. Uh, 5,000 signatures to get Jill on the ballot in Kentucky. And that's nothing compared to some states that need like 40,000. But we did it, and it was hard work. And uh, that's how I got started, and I was totally on fire with the campaign and in agreement with all of the platforms and the ideas and the thoughts. And so I wanted to do more, and they posted jobs online, and I applied, and here I am. So I've been working with Jill for five weeks now, and it's been a tremendous honor and a tremendous adventure. We've been all across the country. We've been to Chicago. We've been to Washington, D.C. We've been to New York City, which we're heading back towards tomorrow. We've been to Minnesota. We've been to Wisconsin, California, Texas. Uh, we were at the DNC in Charlotte and Ohio, and it goes on and on and on. You get the idea. But it's been a fabulous adventure, and we've met many, many wonderful people, both that are already affiliated with the Green Party and those who are just learning about it. And I try to keep a diary at night so that in 20 years I can look back and remember all of these people and these experiences that we're having. But there's one woman that really sticks out in my mind. And we met her in Cleveland, Ohio. I don't even know her name. Jill had just finished uh, doing the Tavis Smiley and Cornell West Poverty Tour, which if you're not familiar with that, yeah, check it out online. It's really super cool. And um, so she had just finished. It was a big hit. And we were rushing out into the lobby to go to the airport, I think to go to New York City. And this woman stopped Jill. And you could tell just by looking at her that she was really having a hard time. Uh, she told Jill that she's she'd been chronically ill 
and that she was just emotionally and physically and spiritually just wiped out. And she talked about how she felt as if all of her power had been taken away from her. And it really struck me hard. And in that off guard moment of rushing out, I didn't know what to say to her. I didn't know what to say to give her even just the smallest amount of reassurance in that moment. And so I realized later what I wanted to say to her. And so I want to say that to you tonight. And that is, as long as you have your voice, you always have your power. And that's so true. And Jill, Jill alluded to that some tonight. And one of the easiest ways in a, in, a, in a nation where money has so much weight is by using your voice. It's an easy way to get our message across and to build a party and to fight for the things that we all believe in. As you know, we all have our individual struggles. I'm a student. I'm a grad student, so I've got student debt on my back. I'm a member of the LGBTQ community fighting for, for fairness in Kentucky. Um, which, you know, is pretty non-existent if you haven't known anything about Kentucky. <laughs> or can know the stereotypes, some of them are true. Um, so there's something that we're all working on, multiple issues. And so I want to encourage you to use your voice. And there are free and easy ways, and I love the word free. So Facebook, Jill mentioned Facebook. It's just Jill Stein. Um, you know, it'll come down in all the lists. She's got her own profile, but the one that says Jill Stein that has about 60,000 likes at this point, that's the one you want to go to and like it. and look at the pictures of where we are and what we're doing. You can follow us, you can like, you can share, and you can use it as a great way to tell your friends about what you've learned. Also on Twitter, we're at Jill Stein 2012, and we do daily updates. Make sure you add that 2012 after Jill Stein, because if you just do Jill Stein, I'm sure she's lovely, but it's not this Jill Stein. <laughs> so Jill Stein 2012 on Twitter. and. Um, we have a person whose sole job is social media, so she's doing great stuff on there. Um, and then lastly, JillStein.org, as she alluded to. Um, we do all of our press releases and lots of info on there. You can, uh, you can download flyers. You can click on the Get Stuff button. We've got great t-shirts. I brought for you tonight some free buttons and bumper stickers. Please take them. They're on that table back there. Uh, wear them proudly. Put them on your car where people will see them wherever you go. Um, and I also pass around a sign-up sheet, too. That's um, a wonderful, easy way for you to be in touch with a campaign and to get signed up with our newsletter. You can also check, yes, I want to volunteer, and you can write if you want to on there if you didn't get a chance to sign it or come back. You know, I'm a photographer, or I'd like to do social media, or I'd like to start local, uh, my local campus greens. We can help you with all of that, and you can help us in, in return. Um, and finally, uh, Jill mentioned the little form that, <laughs> that if you're going to uh, make a donation, which, you know, whether it's $2, $20, or we always say the limit legally is $2,500 in case you have a lot of change in your pocket and you need some more. <laughs> so $2,500 is the limit. Please, please, please fill out this form so that we don't get into big trouble with, with the FEC. Um, you can do cash, which is uh, sort of our least favorite because then we have to carry it around and figure out what to do with it. But it is, we will take cash, but also credit card and check are easiest. And if you can just fill this out, um, I can also swipe a credit card or a debit card on my little magic square thing, which may, works about 70% of the time when it's feeling cooperative. Uh, and so we would greatly appreciate that, whatever you can do. Uh, we want to thank you so much for being here tonight and for coming to learn more about Jill and the campaign and for uh, lending your voice and your own power to us. Thank you. Thank you.